So hi, everyone, and welcome to the digital commerce ecosystem. My name is Bon Jovanovic, and this is David Kitchen. So, and we don't have a picture for David. I'm sorry, you'll, ju you'll just have to take a really good look at him. Uh, so, I'm Boyan, and I was the lead developer for Commerce Kickstart V2. I've also worked on many contrib modules, some of them like Views, Use Bulk Operations, in Entity Form, and among others, I've worked on Commerce License and Commerce License Billing, which we will be seeing today. Hi, I'm David Kitchen, I'm the technical lead for Commerce Guys in the UK, and uh, I've worked on a range of our modules as well, including Commerce VAT, Commerce Funds, and more is the e-commerce checkout Ajax. We work for Commerce Guys. We are the company behind Drupal Commerce with about 60 people in offices in Paris, France, London, England, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we provide a wide range of services around Drupal Commerce, including consulting and support, and since recently, a new cloud hosting platform called platform.sh. So what is digital commerce? This really covers anything that's not a physical product, something that's a service, or a product that's delivered electronically. So this could be downloads like eBooks, or some premium content that you're giving access to on your website, support services, or some subscription to a product or service on your website. This could be one-time or recurring. So we first had this use case while we were developing the Commerce Guys marketplace. We had, we had a wide range of partners such as PayPal and PayMail and hosted PCI and many others. And the idea was to allow people to check out a product, for, for example, PayPal, and then at the end of checkout, provision the account for them and then show the credentials so that they can enter that in their uh, payment module configuration. Uh, and we quickly realized that the workflow is the same for each one. So we need um, some kind of an entity that shows uh, the, what we just created. It needs to store the credentials. And also each of the partners sometimes had additional requirements for additional information to be gathered during checkout. So you, we would need to ask, for example, for the user's address or email or any kind of question. We would store that. And then when provisioning the account, we would send that information. Once we got the credentials, we would store all that on the entity. So that was our first use case. As you can see, it makes sense to have some kind of a bundle for each of the partners and to have some kind of synchronization code for each of those partners. But the concept is the same. And then we started selling support tickets. And the idea here is that you would go to our Turbo Tickets page and you would enter what's bothering you. So you would provide a title and a body. You would add the product to cart. And when you checked out and paid us $99, we would create the ticket uh, on our Zendesk system, uh, save the ID, and then show you the link. So you can follow along as our support people help you go through your problem. So once again, we gather information at the beginning. At the end, we provision something, and we save the return information so we can show it to you later on in an email or in your user pages. And then we started doing cloud hosting. And that has uh, a similar flow. If you want to have your own commerce platform, you would start checkout, check the zone where you would want the platform to be provisioned, for instance, Europe. And then at the end of checkout, we would create your commerce platform in the cloud, and you would get a link so you can access that. Later on, you are able to see all of your platforms that you have, so a platform for each of your sites. And at the end of each month, we would charge you for that platform. So in this case, it's no longer a one-time thing. We are actually going to charge you every month, of course, which is the recurring use case. So the question is, how do we track all of this in Drupal and Drupal Commerce? And we need something that's going to be the resource that we're subscribing to or buying or selling to the user. So what we needed was a new entity to provide this. So we work from our line item that we create in our original checkout. And as we add a product that's got the subscription or service to it, we create a license. And this is the entity storing all of our information. And this refers to the original product that was added to the cart and the user that has access to the license. The license then has all of the field information. So we can add fields, just a fieldable entity to refer to the product that's been 
told on the third party service or what access level they've got, what their API key is, or any port of information for their license. So here comes an interesting detail. We use a module called Entity Bundle Plugin, which we developed for a client named Cartier back in the day. And what it allows us to do is to have a different entity class for each entity bundle. So let's take nodes as an example. You, would, you have multiple node types, for example, a blog post and a page. In this case, a blog would be an instance of one class, but the page would be an instance of another class. This is great because it allows both of them to implement the same interface and to have the same methods, but of course different code in those methods. So you can see how that's useful in the commerce example, because if we ask for the access details, meaning tell the user how to access the thing that he just bought, uh, a file license type can provide the link to the file, so for example, the link to the ebook that was just purchased, but the platform license type can provide the link to the platform that was just provisioned to him. And this also allows us to have an easy way to create fields that are specific to those bundles, to those license types. We have a fields function that returns just the field definitions and Entity Bundle Plugin makes sure to create and maintain those fields. It's called Entity Bundle Plugin because we use CTools plugins to discover those classes. And it's a pretty common way of doing this kind of a thing in Drupal 7. And now you know what we've built. We've built Commerce License. Commerce License is that framework for selling access to a local or a remote resource that's represented by a product. And it provides the license entity type, which can have multiple bundles depending on what you're selling. And there's the API for activating a license, expiring or revoking it, and everything around it that needs to happen in the checkout flow and afterwards. A license can be time limited. So when I create the product for what I'm selling, I can say that it's valid for only a specific amount of days or only one month. So if I sold you an ebook, uh, the access can be revoked after a month or whenever. And that is automatically expired by Cron, of course. A license can be configurable, which means that it has some fields that the user must uh, enter before checkout is complete. And we provide two ways to do that. Either you will e install inline entity form and get those fields on the add to cart form. So you can see the turbo ticket example where we ask for the title and the phone number and the description on the add to cart form. What you're doing here is actually editing the license which has been created at that moment. Or we provide a checkout pane that does the same thing in the middle of checkout. So it, it's your choice, and this allows us to gather the information that we need. So I will ask for the ticket information, or I will ask for the platform location, and anything else that business dictates. And a license can be synchronizable, which means that at the end of checkout, it needs to provision an account or contact a remote service. So once I finish checkout, uh, the synchronization is queued. It's added to a queue and we have a trash worker that processes the licenses one by one, calling the synchronized method on the license. So at that point, the license contacts the remote service, creates the account, and then stores the returns credentials or IDs to be able to show it to the user. Now, at checkout complete, we have this special checkout pane that keeps refreshing the license until the queue gets processed. So the user sees a loading screen saying, we are provisioning your product. And as soon as that's complete, that is replaced with the actual credentials. So the user can see, click here to access your platform, or we've created your support ticket, go here to see it or anything else that needs to happen. And we also support automatically retry functionality, so if by any chance the, the remote service is temporarily unavailable, we will tell the user that provisioning will happen later and that he will be contacted and we will continue to retry in the background. And this is all done completely for you. So we have three example modules built in that you can use for different license use cases in Drupal. The first is commerce license role. This use case would be the premium membership where you're giving access to a role and then configuring that role around 
uh, different levels of access using something like node access or role level access, field access, already existing in Drupal. As you create a product, you can associate this with a particular role and whether the access is limited or um, unlimited for length periods and how it renews. We also have commerce file. This is uh, for the download case, so you're providing access to files. This could be ebooks, music, videos. The product, again, created has a file field. You can upload multiple files, so that's product. Files can be updated after the customer has purchased the product, and they'll get access to those new files as they go online. Through the checkout process, as they come to the end of the checkout, in that license information, they get their products to download straight away, or they can come back to their file uh, download page on their My account. And the detail that I really like is that the checkout confirmation thing works even if you're in anonymous checkout. So even if I'm not logged in, when I complete checkout, I will be able to download the files that I've seen. And of course, the downloads can be limited in case we want to preserve bandwidth. So if we go, yeah. So if we're providing a streaming service, we can do this with the display formatter using something like Media.js to format the music file into something that you can play, um, or you can also use the next one, uh, full integration with Amazon S3 for storing the files off-site. So if you've got very large files and you want to keep those off your server, you can uh, store them here and uh, reference them, and the download is provided through a one-use, one-time link, which is going to preserve our download limits as well, so that uh, allows you to track and restrict access, making sure that only those with the license to access file actually can get to it. Our final use case is Commerce License Node. This is for giving permission to create content. So this example use case might be a classified ads website where you want to license the permission to create a single or uh, nodes that is the advert and give that a limited life or charge on a regular basis for how long the user wants to keep that advert active. So we've seen how we can use commerce license to implement many kinds of e-commerce use cases. So we are able to implement premium membership or we can implement a download site or we can implement a classified site. And so far, we've ass assumed that this is a one-time purchase. The user pays and he gets his access, and possibly once that access is done, he can pay again to get some more. But, of course, we want to keep getting the money out of the user. So we want to have recurring billing, and we want to be able to charge the user for those licenses every once in a while. So how does recurring work in Drupal in general? Well, to start with, you need to have a payment module that implements card on file support. And Commerce Card on File is a module that provides an API for the tokenization services that the payment gateways offer. So many payment gateways like Stripe, like Braintree, like Paymail, Authorized.net, uh, allow to store the card. So once you pay on their servers, they will store your card and they will send us a token that represents that card. And then we can use that token to make further purchases instead of asking you for your card. Of course, it also sends additional identifying information so that is safe to store. We get the last four digits of the card, we get the card holder's name and expiration, and we can show this information so that the customer is able to identify the card that is being used. And research shows that more than 50% of e-commerce sites globally use uh, a feature like this because it makes checkout much faster and therefore much uh, more likely to complete. The user doesn't need to re-enter his card. He can just click and go ahead. 
So Cardon file provides an entity type that stores that safe information as well as an API that can be used to charge a card. And it knows how to distinguish between a hard and a soft decline. So a soft decline is when you've reached the daily limit on your card, meaning that we should probably be able to retry soon. But a hard decline means that your card is effectively dead, either revoked or expired and cannot be used at all for further purchases. And you do know that many of the payment solutions actually offer some kind of a recurring API. And our goal is to avoid it at all costs because they are the, the features that they offer are uh, spotty and they can often not offer metered billing and all of those advanced use cases. So by avoiding that API, by just using the tokenization, every decision is on us. And our code does all the work Allowing, you to offer, allowing us to offer you a consistent experience and a consistent user set and feature set across all of the options that we have. So tomorrow you can change from authorize.net authorize to paymill and we will still offer the same features, which is really convenient. Um, so unfortunately all of my images that I've added aren't gonna work um, on, on this. Um, can you switch to it locally rather than from? Yeah, let's not do that. Otherwise, all of the images aren't going to work. Yeah. Um, so um, what we want to talk about is um, physical subscriptions first. So this use case would be the example of someone ordering something that they're going to get delivered regularly to them. You buy it the first time and check out. You pay and it gets shipped to you. And then you have picked to get that delivered to you every month. Every month after that, on the same date, you're going to get the item is recurred, you're going to get billed for it, and then it's going to get shipped to you. In this case example, we're talking about uh, prepay billing, that is where the payment is taken before the service is provided. And the important use case here is also asynchronous subscriptions. That is that the subscription takes place on the same day of every month based on the user's choice of when they subscribed. And this is where uh, Commerce Recurring was developed. So Commerce Recurring was a UK development. It's ideal for the physical subscription, producing new orders every month in an asynchronous process. But when you look at the digital subscriptions, you will realize that it's quite different. So take a look, for example, at your mobile subscription, your mobile plan. So the first thing that we notice is that we have a concept of a plan. We have two plans or possibly more, and we are able to switch from them uh, when desired. Also, there is metered billing, which means that I have some kind of usage that is given to me in my plan, and if I use more than that, I'm charged some kind of a fee per unit. So if I got a 1,000 messages to send in my plan, but I sent 2,000, then the other 1,000 will be charged using what is called the overage fee. So we have plans and we have usage. Additionally, no matter when I subscribe, I'm always charged on the first of the month. And this is called the synchronous billing cycle because no matter when you subscribe, we will always bill you on the same day. And this is something that uh, digital subscriptions usually follow. Additionally, if you subscribed uh, in the middle of the previous month, for example, uh, that means that you've had the service only for half of the month. You will only pay half of the planned price, and this is called prorating. You also notice that we are not paying for next month. We are paying for the previous month, and this is called uh, post-billing, post-payment. And this is important whenever you have any kind of metered billing, of course, because if you're doing prepayment, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to know how much the user will actually spend and owe you. 
And when you look at any kind of a SaaS product, you will see that they follow the exact same model. So they have multiple plans. They always have some kind of usage that is included in those plans, and you are able to switch the plans as needed. You are billed on the first of the month for the previous month, and you can cancel at any time. And when we looked at commerce recurring, it was pretty clear that it was optimized for physical recurring and that it could not be used for this case because it is the exact, exact opposite. So it's synchronous instead of asynchronous, it's uh, postpaid instead of prepaid, and so on. And this is why we developed commerce license billing. And commerce license billing is our answer to this problem. It specifically deals only with charging for the licenses. You have some kind of a billing cycle. At the end of that billing cycle, we get all of your active licenses, so your premium membership or your platform account, and we charge for that. We calculate the usage and the cost of that. We charge for that as well. And our goal is to support any kind of a payment plan. So no matter what your CFO tells you, it should be possible to click a, a few checkboxes and radio buttons and have the module do the rest, handle all of the hard parts in a way that's easy to use and completely covered by tests. So the first important feature that we have, of course, is plans. A plan is just a product, so you can easily track which plans are being used at the moment. You will remember that each license references the current product, which means it references its current plan, and we can change the product of the license, therefore changing the plan. Prorating works in this case, so if in the middle of the month I switch from a $60 product to a $80 product or a $80 plan, then I will pay half of the first one, the $30, and I will pay half of the second one, the $40. And if I want to, as an admin, I can configure to postpone the license changes. So this is usually how your mobile plans work. If you require, if you request a change of a plan or even a cancellation, that will only happen at the end of the billing cycle, therefore avoiding the prorating. We also support metered billing and by default, we support two different kinds of metered billing, and those are counters and gauges. A counter is always charged in total. So a good example of that is bandwidth, for example. So as you continue to use a subscription, you keep using up bandwidth or sending emails, and at the end of the month, all of your usage is totaled, the free usage is deducted, and the rest is priced. You get one line item for the usage for and for the resources that you consumed. Now, the second variant is a gauge, and a gauge tracks the distinct values over time. So let's imagine that you had in a hosting company development environments or servers. So if I used to have and use two development environments, and then I switched to having three development environments, the system cannot just charge me for five. That would be kind of awkward. Instead, we would prorate the price for the two environments, depending on how long it was used, and then we would prorate the price of the three environments. So, and I would always get a line item for each of those. So I would get a line item saying you used two environments from this date to this date, and a line item saying you use three environments from this date to this date. And if I used the free quantity for a while, so for example, let's say that two environments were included in my plan, then of course that's not priced and that line item is not added. And the good news is that these two are provided by plugins, so you can easily provide your own plugin that overrides one of these or does something completely new. And the plugin is the one that controls both the counting and the pricing. So if you need any kind of custom pricing logic, that is very easy to implement and plug, plug into the system. Of course, we, we support both prepayment and postpayment. And in the case of postpayment, of course, the flow is that the first checkout is free. Why? Because you will pay at the end of the month. So you went through checkout, you just inputted your credit card so we can charge you later, and you completed. This is 
at this point, the better payment gateways will usually do a zero authorization, meaning that no amount was actually authorized, and the less good ones will do a $1 authorization, for example. Now, the UX here is important. I am checking out and I'm giving my credit card and I have no idea how much I will be charged at the end. So this is why we support uh, what's on the screen. It's, a, it's an estimation feature, which looks just like a card. And it says, if you had a normal usage with the plan that you selected, this is how much you would pay at the end of the month, therefore reassuring me. And we use pricing rules for everything, so a pricing rule will set the price of the products to zero if it's postpaid, if it's prepaid, then it will prorate it so the user will actually see how much he is paying and so on. And postpaid is actually our default use case since it's the most common for these uh, SAS use cases. Now, we support uh, different kinds of billing cycles. We already defined what a synchronous and an asynchronous billing cycle is. Again, the billing cycles are pluggable and the plugin will generate them. We have a default one where you can configure your period. So you can say that you have a one hour billing cycle, great for testing, or one day, one week, one month, half a year, a year, that's up to you and you can select whether it's asynchronous, meaning that it always lasts the same number of days, or it's synchronous, meaning that the user is always billed on the same day. And the great thing about it being pluggable is that you can always plug your own. So I, I saw this cute tweet a few months ago that says how great it is that a certain internet, internet service provider had this lunar option where the customer is charged each full moon. And if you want to implement this, you will just register a new plugin, and in 10 lines of code, this will be possible. So you too can be cute. We also have a really nice billing dashboard powered by Views Megaro. And if you ever used Kickstart, you will you probably saw this pattern. You can see a row and click a link that says Analyze or View or whatever, and then the row will expand, and below it you will get uh, information that's easy to scan. Uh, and in this case, for each of your recurring orders, you can see uh, which billing cycle it uses, when it starts it, when it ends. You can see all of the active licenses that are in that recurring order being charged for. You can see when they were activated. So for example, you can see if uh, one platform was created six months ago, but another one was activated three months ago. And you can see the plan history showing uh, all of the plans that the user used and for how long, and you can see the actual usage. How much is the current usage and whether the order can actually be closed. So because we have this really nice feature where we won't close the previous billing cycle until we know the usage. Because it's common for you to do billing for an external application and it needs to calculate the usage and post back to your Drupal install. And in that case, we will, and let's say that it's the 2nd of March, so we will open the billing cycle for, for March while waiting for February to be computed and charged. Of course, people often ask uh, how they can do discounts. It's common to say the first month is free or you got 10% off for the first two months. And we have this easy ability to discount any number of billing cycles. Uh, the trick is in the fact that we just use normal price calculations for the recurring orders that we create and charge, so all of your pricing rules still run. And you can see in plain English, but with tokens, how such a rule would look like. So let's say that if I have a recurring line item that's being calculated, and the number of renewals on the license is zero, meaning that this is our first billing cycle, we'll just add a 100% discount and make that first billing cycle free. And that way you can still use all of your normal discount rules and discount tools that you're used to and don't need to do anything special. So what happens during the recurring process and the users can't, user can't pay? So their card is declined. We've developed a module called Commerce Dunning and this handles this process. Uh, 
a card can have, uh, or a payment can come up with two types of decline, and the way that you handle those can change depending on that decline. A hard decline for those cards that have been cancelled or closed, the card has expired, or a soft decline where the user doesn't have the money to pay in their account. It's come back to say this card is all valid, but it just doesn't have the money. We start off a process where we're going to inform the user that they can't pay and then schedule new retries to take their card payment, giving the user the opportunity to update their card details through card and file. So at this future actions, we hopefully are going to be able to take the payment. If we don't, through this schedule, that might be five, seven, and then ten days, and after this they still haven't paid, we can then kick off the process using rules to cancel their subscription, close their account, and stop their ac access to the service. And this is really important uh, for the, the post-pay service where you're relying on the card and file working. And another part within the Dunning management is also pre-notification. So if a card is about to expire, you can notify the user to make sure they update it before this gets to this point. And hopefully you're using the message module to handle all of your emails because it allows you to define your email templates separately from rules and then easily see which emails were sent and what they contained. So this Commerce Dunning has a sub-module that defines all of the message types for every single kind of an email that we're sending, allowing you to easily customize them and later on see the Dunning notifications that were sent out. So Commerce Funds is a useful module for working with the situations where you need to provide credit or have credit for the user. So this could be the use cases of the cancelled or closed accounts where they want to close their service partway through a period and we need to give them credit for the store to spend on some other service or where you want to use a prepay service or voucher. So you're going to give your customers a voucher for $50 worth of credit. They can come along to the store, deposit that into their credit, open their accounts, and for their first billing period, they can start using that credit and then start paying after that with their payment card details. Commerce Funds allows you to specify the funds account for the users in multiple currencies so they can hold it in multiple currencies as well as... Um, the, the default store currency. So this is great if your service just launched and it's still kind of unstable, so the service crashes and you tell the user, we are really sorry, here's $20 credit off your next order. Finally relevant to all of this digital commerce, we want to talk about taxes and digital goods and services. If you were looking at digital goods and services before, um, they can be sold anywhere. You've got a worldwide range of customers. Previously, when we were talking about just physical goods, when you ship these out as a UK customer, if I buy something from America, I get a big sticker on it saying, you need to pay customs this much before you can get it. But with digital goods, uh, lots of countries are now starting to take action against this and implementing their own import duties effectively when you sell electronic services into customers in those countries. So far, there are 32 countries that have either already implemented or are implementing this process, the most biggest being the whole of the EU, which starts next year. To work with this and general requirements for tax, we've developed a commerce VAT module. And this takes the tax calculation into a two-step process. Firstly, deciding the place of supply. This is the country that the customer is in based on all of these tax laws to decide where they are. And then a second stage to decide what rate they need to pay based on the type of product. This is de de um, developed through an API that allows easy definition of the country. And that country can regularly be more than just a country or just parts of a country. And what rates are available. All ready supplied are the European Union and a number of other countries, but uh, there's also opportunities for people to contribute. Um, ones particularly, Canada is one that uh, is needed, as that's a um, VAT using country. Okay, so we should be able to move to questions. Do we have any? Yeah. 
Sure. Uh, really interesting, by the way. Uh, really impressive what you've done. Um, so I can think of a couple questions, but the central one is this. It's the use case where the, the user's right to use the resource is controlled from you know outside your website or Drupal site or whatever. And, and so I, I'm interested in how you can handle that. And that, that also sort of I think subdivides into two cases. One's where the, uh, the external service that's going to determine whether the user is allowed to continue using the service or not is connected. So a web service approach is possible. The other case is where it's disconnected and you have to do something like an expiration date or whatever. So can you just talk about how you would implement those things? Yeah, so it all, one, it all depends on who the primary source of truth is. If it's the Drupal site, then the flow always starts from Drupal and the license, and then we trigger the synchronization process to do what's needed. But if it's actually the external application, then that application will contact the Drupal site through the API and then modify the license in any way needed. So it will register usage or expire a license or set an expiration date for the system to handle that automatically or whatever else is needed. So basically you, will, you would provide an API through services and we still don't have one publicly but we are, prepare, we are preparing ourselves to share that and then that ju just works. I think so but I, I think I'm describing a little different situation here. So it's past the transaction time yeah. and past the provisioning time and at this point, um, so it's three months later and I want to check whether to expire the you know the right, and so I either want to have have obtained at the at the original um, payment time an expiration date, so that gets passed to me, or I want to be able to make a call back, you know, say is this you know is this user still valid? It's, it's sort of like a, a recheck. You know? Yeah. So all of that is possible through the API that you would expose, uh, you probably using services, and we can discuss smaller details after the talk. This, this all looks. This is not working. Um, <laughs> so we've been building uh, a couple sites using the Recurly service, uh, and I'm really excited to see that we can actually rebuild them completely natively in Drupal Commerce, which is which is fantastic. Thank you. Um, but one thing that I have a question about is prorating upgrades. So if we have a set of subscription services at different levels. Can we handle the proration of accounts if they decide to upgrade in the midst of? Yes, that is done automatically for you. Uh, you will either allow upgrades to happen automatically if you configure it that way. In that case, prorating must always happen. Or you will specify that the upgrade will happen at the end of the cycle, therefore avoiding the prorating. And I really think that we have something great compared to Recurly here because uh, especially if you're using metered billing, Recurly requires you to do all of the calculations yourself. The only thing you can do is tell Recurly, this is my line item and it's this much for usage. But in our case, we actually track and calculate the usage for you. So you, you can do one API call and we will do all the rest for you. So the integration is actually significantly simpler. Um, and just sort of the same question, but have you figured out how to handle the use case of downgrades? Is it is it a similar thing where we could use commerce funds to, to take back yeah, the credit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in case you're doing postpaid, then you don't even need credits. The, the pro rating will just happen. And in case you're using prepaid, then yes, you can just award the user uh, funds using commerce funds. Or once again, you can postpone that change to the next cycle. Excellent. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks Thanks for such a, a great framework. It's awesome. Um, I've got a question around commerce card on file and just security implications around that. Um, are there any extra considerations you need in terms of PCI compliance when using um, tokens? Yeah, so I, whenever I answer a PCI question, I first mention Drupal PCI compliance report. I hope you've all read it, and if not, please do so as soon as possible. Uh, so according to the PCI standard, uh, we are safe to store the four digits of the card and the cardholder name and expiration without any kind of encryption that is allowed. 
and then what remains are the usual PCI considerations of the different payment gateways. And as you know, depending on your choice of the payment gateway, you will fall into different categories of the PCI compliance standards. So, for example, Authorize.net actually sends the credit card numbers through your own server, which puts you into C, but Stripe and Paymill and Braintree communicate directly with the other server, putting you into PCI compliance category A, which is significantly simpler. Thank you. I apologize if I uh, missed it. What about um, doing a partial refund for a user? Uh, say you purchase something and you know, like a 30-day subscription, and they want a refund halfway through. Can you? reverse a charge or, or partially reverse a charge or is that only supported? Yeah, right now we have no ability to actually issue an actual refund. We can okay. either avoid doing anything or provide store credit and refund, actual refunds are a future step probably by integrating with the co commerce RMA module which is the one that does the uh, return authori authorizations. Okay. It, it would be um, possible depending on the payment gateway some offer some payment gateways offer partial refunds on the initial transaction, but it would be a manual process at the moment. Through the gateway, go like yeah, yeah. going to PayPal or going to Authorize.net and doing it from there. So, so for example, with Authorize.net, you can do that in Drupal. You can refund, do a partial refund on a transaction from the original transaction, uh, but it would be a manual process of going in and saying how much to refund from that original Is transaction. Is that on the payments tab? Can you do it directly it's, from the payments tab of the order? Yeah, you go into the payment section of the order. Right, yeah. right. Awesome. And, uh, sorry, one other question. Um, I saw you, you have the, uh, the products, which were the licenses, you know, set terms that you create. Is it possible to have a dynamic product that you manually enter uh, a start and stop date? Um, I guess what I'm thinking of is not the user checking out, but somebody taking a, a manual purchase. Maybe they did it offline. Maybe they did it with cash or, or, or check. And then a user would manually enter that for a specified time. Is that possible? Yeah, so, so technically it should be possible for you to manually create an order and a line item and, and just complete that process. But as far as I know, there are still a few bugs remaining. There is an issue in the queue about one of them. And uh, before we release RC1, I will make sure that that works without problems. Okay. So Thank yeah, you. that's definitely something we want to support in, in its entirely. Thank you. I actually have a follow-up question on the, the PCI uh, uh, question over there. Um, so if I change payment gateways, does that mean that my users have to re-enter payment information? So yes. That, that so the way card and file works is that it all, it's always tied to one payment gateway because the tokens cannot be transferred. Some payment gateways support some kind of an import export, but it's really, really specific to them, and not all of them do it. So we need to tie ourselves to only one. Yeah. It, it's payment gateways don't want you to move, so they make yeah. it as hard as possible. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, Recurly is PCI level one compliant, which costs more than $100,000. If you give us that money, we'll add the feature. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I have a follow-up question on, or a, a second question about, um, so you can, you're, you're turning uh, hard decline or soft decline, but that's essentially at the processing level. Is, do you guys have any type of risk management before it gets there, so like if it's uh, somebody who continues to enter fraudulent information. Yeah, no, so uh, that would be a great feature, but right now we don't. It, it's, it's something that you could um, all potentially build through rules, so uh, if they're repeating, if their transactions repeat to fail from the payment gateway, depending on your payment gateway, depends on what feedback you get for their initial transaction. So with some payment gateways, you get levels of risk against the card, the address, and how much they're paying. Um, so you can pull all of that information into your rules or flag your orders or your users based on how many failed transactions they've had. But it's, that's all going to depend on the, the business process that you want to implement to monitor that. If you're only dealing with uh, a $399 a month subscription or a $399 a month subscription, your choice of how you manage that might be different. So one more question about taxation of digital goods in the United States. Um, as you probably know, this is a mess. Um, varies state by state and by particulars of the digital good and changes all the time. 
and interacts with Nexus. Um, any plans, anybody working on dealing with this problem? Could you make a deal with Avalara or somebody like that? So we have, I'd, I'd suggest using a, a third party service that's going to do this for you. Um, it's the US sales tax is, is actually much more complicated than for deciding what rates to charge than, than European VAT is. Um, we have two, Exacta and um, Avatax, in our marketplace. So. Now, earlier you had mentioned that uh, Authorized.net was a PCI level C. You gave a list of level A's, and I couldn't write down fast enough all the. Yeah, so if, you if you open about. Drupal PCI compliance.org in the report, you have all of the levels, what that means, and you have how all of the big payment gateways sort, basically, and where they belong. And the author is actually updating that for the new standard that will be valued from 2015 as well. So it's really a great resource to follow. The, the general advice is always do C if you can, because that's keeping it safe but you should be able to target A uh, with certain uh, payment providers, therefore lowering the amount of work that you need to do. A uh, lot of great modules. Thanks, by the way. Um, I was wondering about the uh, release status on the four or five that you talked about. Are they in dev? Are they stable? Are there ones that you recommend that we don't use in production yet, or where, where are they at? Yeah, so Commerce License has had a stable release for more than six months now, maybe even maybe even more. It has had multiple stable releases. It's completely stable. Uh, Commerce License billing uh, has a beta 2 currently, and I will be tagging a release candidate in the next two weeks. Uh, we are running it in production, as are several other people, and it has complete test coverage, uh, which makes it a bit safer. Uh, of course, our use case is postpaid. Uh, I've noticed there are still some smaller issues with prepaid billing, which we are working to fix in the next week before the RC1 is tagged. So you should be good on that front. Uh, Card and file recently saw major work. Uh, I tagged the beta, but uh, also very soon we will have an actual final release. I can say that right now it's in really good shape, and the, on, the only reason why it's still in beta is because it's missing a few features that I would like to see, especially around the UI. And Commerce Funds is still in, in beta as well. Or dev. Is dev, yeah. Um, that's still got some, um, there's been a process of moving that over from, uh, um, to an entity-based system, and there's still some work to do on things like escrow payments uh, that uh, you can also use funds for. Uh, if you're building a marketplace or that uh, type of environment. Um, the um, commerce, the license role is within commerce license, yeah. so that's uh, released, and commerce license node is still in dev as well. Yeah, commerce file doesn't have a final release yet. It's in beta because we don't have an upgrades path for 1.x, but judging by the lack of interest and contributors in that regard, I'm just going to go ahead and tag a stable release. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, my company chose um, Magento because of the integration with um, fulfillment providers like ShipIt. Um, what are the, what integration with physical goods fulfillment providers does Commerce have right now, if any? Yeah, I really don't know. So th this is the, the digital talk, so okay. we. we yeah, we, we would need to ask someone. So please come, come by our stand, the Commerce Guys yes. stand, and we will see what we can find. We do have some, that's, but I can't remember what they are off the top of my head here as well. One more question. Um, you had mentioned having messages to notify a user of an expiring card using the message module. What about uh, other types of actions, like a, like a notification to remind you of something expiring or you know, like a week? I mean, is that built in or is that something that's built in? Yeah. Yeah. So some of them are built in, some are not, but we are trying to see which ones we are still missing. So whatever you find that's missing, open an issue and we will add that one as or, well. Or even better, create the rule and put the yeah. <laughs> um, I can talk about fulfillment options afterwards if you're interested, I'm sitting right in front of you. Um, I was just going to say that I, I wrote the uh, Ubercart recurring module <laughs> once upon a time. and. Um, ended up having to support a variety of customers who were retaining plain text credit card information in their database uh, and of course weren't actually having um, recurring charges be processed at all. 
And this represents like a tremendous um, improvement over what we've ever had in uh, the Drupal world before. So I just wanted to say bravo. Like this is really, really solid stuff. So thanks for showing us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So as I said, we are at the Commerce Guys booth all day, every day. If you have any follow-up questions or just want to chat, drop by and we'll see you. And don't forget to review the session. Right. Okay. So yeah, this is the Commerce Village. And please provide feedback so we can improve and feel good about what we've done. <laughs> Thank you.